Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you sound so good. That's great. We are starting a brand new series this morning. I'm excited about this. Looking forward to it. And uh, uh, there, there are different subjects that we're going to go through. Uh, one of the subjects we're going to go through is the people in your life and in my life who are negative, you know, like the naysayers, we're going to learn how to handle that. And uh, we're, the, the, this subject is going to be all about the reality that God has tools and skills for each one of us in the different areas of our lives. And that passage of Scripture is going to be, it's, with that, we're going to embrace that passage of Scripture for this entire series. And I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm totally stoked. Ecclesiastes 10.10 10 says, if the axe is dull and its edge is unsharpened. Some of you know what it's like when you're swinging an axe and, the, and it's not sharp. It's unsharpened. More strength is needed, but skill will bring success. In other words, don't work harder, work smarter. In other words, take the time, stop swinging the axe, sharpen the axe, and then go back to swinging the axe, and you will be so much more effective. Guys, this applies in so many different areas of our lives, and I want us to stop as a church family and look at different areas in our lives and, and be willing to look at God's Word and look at the tools and the skills. He has tools and skills for you and I in the different areas of our lives. He wants us to be successful in life, successful in business. And it takes skill to be successful in life and in business. But James, if you just work hard, you'll get... It takes more than just working hard. It takes skill. But James, if you really desire and you, and you really want to go after, it takes more than desire. It takes more than dedication and hard work. I got a surprise for you. It takes more even than prayer. All of these are so important, and, and, and it takes all of them. But the Bible says it takes skill. You could be the most sincere person on the planet, but if you have no skill, you're not going to be successful in what you're trying to accomplish. The Bible says skill will bring success. It's a big deal. I, I, want, to, I want to dig into this. Here's the good news. Skills can be learned. We can learn skills. He wants us to learn skills. And today I want to look at one whole area, one whole skill, and we don't think of it in terms of a skill, but one whole skill that God wants to develop, and that's in our lives, and that's knowing how to recognize what is most important. What's most important in the different areas of our lives? Every single day, we walk through our days and we make decisions. Am I going to do this or am I going to do this? Knowing which of those, which of those two to choose is an important skill. Knowing what matters most is an important skill. And I got to tell you something. Here's the disparaging thing. There are few people in our culture who have that skill. People all around us are walking through life, not even paying attention to where they are going. Leaders understand how important knowing this principle is because leaders have the ability to find what's most important and focus on it. And they let everything else fall by the wayside. And that is why they accomplish, because they focus. The Apostle Paul said, this one thing I do. Nuts to the other 40 things. 
It is this one thing I do, Paul says. And you're smart people. You know that we don't have enough time for everything. We just can't. We just don't. We can't do everything. You know what the good news is? God hasn't called you to do everything. He hasn't called me to do everything. We can't do everything. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he said, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. You and I can do anything we want in life. We're free to do anything we want in life. God is not going to force you or me to do anything. He's given us our will. But some things are not necessarily wrong. They're just not necessary. And figuring that out, here's what it's going to do. It's going to save you and I a lot of time. Selection is a key to success being able to decide what is right. And God hasn't called you to fulfill everybody else's will for your life. He's called you to fulfill his will for your life, not their will for your life. The secret of success is is really clarifying your values. I want to talk about this values thing for a few minutes here. Clarifying your values. Do you know where you get your values from? Do you really know? What, what, what is building the character in you? What, what is shaping your values? Where do, they, where do they come from? Because your values are going to determine so many things in your life. Your values are going to determine whether you have stress in life or whether you're a success in life. Your values are even going to determine whether or not you have salvation. Our values are a big deal. And there's some things about our values that we need to know. And, and, and I really dug, dug in on this. And, and I just, just make sure you're listening for this. Because if our values are unclear, then we're going to live a life of confusion. And and if our values are conflicting, we're going to live a life with tension. These are realities in life. If our values, if the values that we embrace are false, then we're going to live a life of deception. And if our values are wrong, if we embrace just wrong values for our lives, we're going to live a life of dysfunction. And God's plan and his desire, and he's so clear in Scripture, is that our lives have clarity, that we we know our values, and and we know what shapes our values. So I want to look at four questions with you this morning. So grab your notes, take them out, and get your pen ready. And if you're not taking notes this morning, grab your notes, take them out, and get get a pen, and let's take notes together, okay? (laughs) The first thing I want you to write down is, What shapes me? The first question I want to look at is, what shapes me? What is shaping you? What is shaping me? And and there are actually three things in this area that that I want to talk about briefly. The one thing that I notice is is that in our lives and in in our culture and in this generation that's moving forward from here, the one thing that shapes us is the media. The the media has constant input into our lives. There are many things that shape us. Guys, our parents shape us. Our friends shape us. School shapes us. Books shape us. The movies shape us. Television shapes us. The number one source that is shaping this generation is the media. You and I need to choose the source that we get our values from. We don't even think about this. We just walk through life, and some of the things that we're going to talk about, they shape who we are. They shape what we think. They shape what political party we're a part of. They they shape all of our thinking. And and many of us are leaving that in the hands of, of people we wouldn't trust as far as we could spit but we're doing that with areas of our lives. 
We need to choose our source. As I look at our culture, people are getting their values from drug dealers. And on the other end of the spectrum, people are getting their values from Jesus. And there are two vastly different perspectives to get your values from. You say, well, James, I, I, kind of, I get my values from myself. Well, how's that working out for you? You want to do that? Look what Jeremiah has to say about that. Jeremiah says the human mind is the most deceitful of all things. That's the human mind. Your, your mind. My mind. The most deceitful of all things. It's incurable. Clarity here, huh? Incurable. No one can understand how deceitful it is. And most translations say, except God. Deceitful. I got my dictionary out, really, my computer, but I, I got my computer out and I looked up this word deceitful to mislead in the wrong direction. When Karen and I got married a couple of years ago, when Karen and I got married, my father and my mom drove down from New York to Virginia because my dad was going to be the one to marry us. And somewhere, Coming from the hotel to the church, my dad went the wrong direction on Route 7. Everybody's sitting there. The ceremony is supposed to start at a given time. I don't remember if it was 9 o'clock or 10. We know what? 5 o'clock. Whoa. <laughs> Story of our lives together. 5 o'clock it's supposed to start. 5.45. He walks in the church. 40, our wedding was delayed 45 minutes. Everybody was sitting there wondering, what's going on? Did Karen take off? Is she not going to marry this guy? What's going on here? Nobody knew. 45 minutes late. Because he got deceived by the direction of where to go. And some of us are spending our lives going in the wrong direction direction to mislead in the wrong direction but but i but i saw it but but i heard it and we don't think about the fact that we could have miss saw it or maybe we could have misheard it a couple of years ago we were, we were in the middle of a service, and I was standing in the back here, and all of a sudden there was a loud noise right over here. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what happened? And so I walked out into the cafe, and I walked back over to a table, and, 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 and Carlos was there, I think, and Jeremiah and Domingo, and they were all there. And I walked up, and I said, what, what happened? What, what? And they looked at me like I was from another planet. Because I thought because there was a loud noise here, there's no way on earth that they didn't hear it there. But I was wrong. They didn't hear it at all. Somebody had made a noise back in here, and it was huge in here, and, and I'm thinking there's no way they didn't hear it there, and they didn't hear it at all. Because I assumed, I, I misheard, the media shapes us. We, we, all day long, the media feeds us, and, and it develops what we think. The other thing that shapes us is the world, the world around us, what everybody else thinks. And John, John writes about that. As a matter of fact, John, the only disciple who lived to old age, John lived to be 94 years old. All the other disciples died early deaths. They died the death of a martyr. But John says this. He says, do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. In other words, if the number one thing that's important to you is what this world is giving you, then you can't have also the number one thing in your life that God has for you. The, the, the world has what it offers. And there are, there are really three things that, that the world offers. In Scripture, I could give you a number of scriptures that just lay this out so clearly. 
one of the things the world offers is looking good. Another thing the world offers is feeling good. And the third thing that it, it offers is having the goods. And, and, and none of those things are inherently bad, but when they become the focus, looking good. There's nothing wrong with looking good. I do my best to, to stay somewhat up in style and, 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 and get coaching on that for sure by my family without question, although they haven't talked me into, haven't talked me into jeans with all the holes in them so that it's free air conditioning. We, in our nation, we spend billions of dollars every year on beauty aids and clothes. Billions. It's okay. It's okay. Makeup. Look, if the barn needs painting, you paint it. No problem. <laughs> One of the things that we're noticing, see, plastic surgeons, there's a whole new phenomenon happening with plastic surgeons. Plastic surgeons are having people come in who have taken a picture of themselves on their phone. And then they've gone and they've, they've looked for an app like Facetune or some of the others, and, and they've made themselves look what they're pretty convinced of is much better. And now they're taking their phone to the plastic surgeon. I, I want you to make me look like this. And surgeons are seeing a rise in this. Looking good is important. Our appearance is important. But if that becomes that important, it's not good. Feeling good in our culture. We, we all want to feel good. Look, our culture uses sex to sell everything from spark plugs to shampoo. We just want to feel good. And then getting the goods. Yeah, we want success. We want, we want wealth. We want riches. And God has no problem with his children having stuff. He wants us to have stuff. But God knows that if stuff has us, there are going to be all kinds of problems. Perspective and values are so important. And you know what the problem Listen to this. Please hear this. The problem is if you and I in our culture, we are constantly bombarded by all three of these. This is what success is. We will end up thinking that that is the purpose of our lives. And that is going in the wrong direction. The third possible source for our values, and we make sure you write this one down, is God and his word. God's desire is that the source for our real values, the number one thing to us, the, the, the path that puts us in route to a destination that we want to be at, is his word. John 8.32, John, Jesus, he, he's recording what Jesus said. John says this, Jesus says this, as John writes it, if you continue in my word, then you will know the truth. And you know what the truth will do? It'll set you free. You can live in freedom. But the world says, no, looking good is important. Well, 1 Samuel says this, Samuel says, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Looking good is different to God than it is to us. Feeling good is different to God. See, feeling good for us depends on happiness. And happiness is not a bad thing, but happiness depends on happenings. And you can't be happy when bad things are happening. And in life, there are happy things and there are things that are not so happy. And we're going to get them all. And God's desire and his plan is that we not only have happiness when it's time to be happiness, but when, it, when we're not happy, we have this deep sense of peace and this deep sense of joy. This is all much deeper and foundational. 
And all of life gets built on it. What does the Bible say about stuff? Well, Jesus said, life is not measured by how much you own. That's not what determines the value of your life. And owning stuff is not bad, and owning a bunch of stuff is not bad. But life is not measured by how much you own. So the question is, who is going to be our authority? You and I have to decide as we walk through lives, what's going to be the authority in our lives? What's going to shape our values? Is it going to be what I think? Is it going to be what the world thinks or, or the media or, or what other people think? So the first question is, what shapes me? The second question is, what will last? We need to make this choice not only on what, is on what is shaping us, but we need to look at what is going to last the longest. And that is what's going to determine what we choose. And honestly, church, we rarely, listen, we rarely evaluate our values as we're walking through life. Do you know when we stop and we evaluate our values? When we hit a problem when we hit a disaster in our lives, when you and I find ourselves where we hit a crisis in our lives, that's when we stop and we say, how did I end up here? How did I end up on this path? How did I end up in this mess and I, this mess and I was on a path and this is, this is where I am now and where did, I, where did I get off the path that I was on that was headed to the destination that I wanted to get to. It's when it's crisis in our lives that we're forced to stop and think, what, what are my values? Who's shaping my values? One of the greatest weaknesses, please hear me, one of the greatest weaknesses in our culture today, and there are many weaknesses in our, we're privileged, believe me, to live where we live, but one of the greatest weaknesses in our culture today is short-term thinking. I want it now. I, I don't care what the price is, I want it now. I could play a probably 100 commercials for you of furniture stores and sport, all kinds of stores and, 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 and 12 months free, inter okay, I want it now. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, he, he kind of steps into this. Actually, that's not true. He doesn't kind of, he just steps right into it. He says this, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Paul's saying, we're, we're followers of Christ. We're a different group of people. We're, we're not marching to the drum of the world around us. We're marching to a different drum. But on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Do you know what eternal means? It means eternal. It means it's going to last forever. Church, God is calling us to do things that are going to last forever. Look, if that, if that doesn't deep inside of you excite something, if that, that doesn't help you realize that you are part of something that is so much better, bigger than you, so much greater than you, so much that is designed by the creator of the universe for you and I to be a part of. It is unseen, but it is eternal. So uh, we, need to, we need to stop and think, am I seeing things correctly? And God's plan is that in all the areas of our lives, especially this area, being able to make decisions, being able to know what is best. That's one of the greatest skills in life that you and I can have. Being able to understand, well, this, this is good, this is good, this, but this is what God has for me. That is a big 
deal? Am I really saying things correctly? As followers of Christ, we deal with temptation. But we think that temptation is either something is good or it's bad, and that's the decision. And that's true. That's a part of temptation. But, it, but it's even more than that. It's, is this best or is this best? And, and, and being able to figure that out. But it goes even farther than that. It's, should it be now or should it be later? In the whole area of finances, sh should, I, should I spend this money now or should I do other things and, and then spend it later? Or, or, sh or should I spend my, or should I, should I be intentional about saving money so that, that it, and when it comes later in life, I, I won't have to worry about that? Or should I spend all my money in terms of this life or, or should I spend my money in terms of the next life for other people? Even in our time, how should I spend my time? Should I spend, my, should, I, should I watch video games 40 hours a week? Or should I give God like, you know, a few hours a week in my time with him and my Bible? We need to learn, we need to learn the skill of knowing what will last and buying into in all areas of our lives, doing things that are going to matter for eternity. The third question I think we need to ask is, will I live what I believe? Living by your values, actually living by your values is called integrity. You know, one of the things, there, there, there's, there, there are not many things in this life that you're going to take with you to heaven. When you leave this planet, you came into this planet a bare little squirmy naked baby. You're going to leave this planet the same thing, just bigger. You can say amen. But you are going to take your character. And you are going to take your integrity. You are going to take what, what Christ is shaping in you with you. In our culture, it is easy to do the easy thing. As a matter of fact, it's easier to do the easy thing very often than do the right thing. The number one stress in America is incongruent lifestyle. That's the number one stress. In other words, it's knowing what's right and knowing you're not doing it. And you live in that arena. We, we know what's right, but, but, but we don't do it. As a matter of fact, as I look at our culture, people are, people are spending their lives embracing damaged philosophy. People are, I look at our culture and people are spending their entire lives embracing a lie. And they're following it with their entire life. And it's a big deal. And you know what Jesus does? He calls us to love them. To love them. Not to holler and scream at them, not to get involved in the whole arena of everything that's shouting and screaming and going on in our culture. He calls us to love them. How do we, how do we as followers of Christ, how do we move down this path? How do we grow like this? There are four quick things I want to look at with you. First, I need to watch what I watch and watch what I read. You know, we're, we're, our mind is a computer, and the output will be determined by whatever we put into it. So I need to watch what I watch and watch what I read. Psalm 119 says, turn my eyes away from worthless things. You know what's scary? The average person of 65, the average 65-year-old person, okay, when, when the average person reaches 65, they will have watched Nine and a half years of television. Nine and a half years of TV. That's scary. 
And most of them probably started like with Barney Fife or something. You know, they, they just, and then and, and the year after year, this stuff gets bad. And then there was a show not long ago talking about television called Supersize Me. And you guys probably know about that. This guy actually, 30 days, just went to McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Just McDonald's. And at the end of 30 days, he was sick, he was overweight, and he had developed health issues. And to quote him, he said, I feel gross. And maybe you work at McDonald's. Just take it easy. I'm not swinging at you. But the point is, fast food is very easy. But it's obviously not the best thing for you. I watch what I watch. I got to tell you, Karen and I watch totally different TV shows. I, I, you know, I have my preferred shows. I love a lot of the car shows, and I could give you a whole list. I love things like American Pickers. I, I, I love Last Man Standing. I think that's one of the greatest shows on TV. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. That's a funny show. But, but that's what I watch. But we, we need to be careful what we watch. So I watch what I... The second thing that is, is we need to be careful about the friends that we choose. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Just a reality, guys. Just a reality. And it's important that there are people in our lives that we are influencing. It's so important that there are people in our lives that we are influencing and witnessing to and reaching out to. But who you run with dictates how you run the race. And we need to be careful. That's why I'll tell you, get into, life groups are starting back up in August, after August 11th. If you're not in a life group, get in a life group. We're going to, uh, we're going to launch them in a big way here. So just get ready for that. Maybe there's something in your life that you're struggling with and you need to be here with a group of people on Friday night and celebrate recovery, working your way through that process, accomplishing what God has for you to accomplish. Careful who, the friends who we choose. If you're single, oh, oh so careful about being sensitive and being specifically praying about, you hear me, guys? Be praying about God's person for your life. Because you want someone, you want the person that God has for you. You want the person whose life is already committed to following Christ. Being careful about the friends I choose, being careful how I spend my money. I won't spend any time on this because I'm going to spend at least two weeks on it in the middle of this series. Careful about the things we do. Careful about how I treat other people. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. In other words, now we're followers of Christ. And you know what he's called us to do? Love God and love people. Love God and love people. But their position is love God and love people. And yesterday, we we blew the roof off loving God and loving people. Because about 50 of us went over to Streetlight USA and it was an army. You'll, you'll, you're going to see. You're going to see more about this. It was an army of us, and we we came on that campus, and people worked their heart out on the entire outside and transformed the outside of the campus. And some of our team went inside and worked inside in some of the buildings. And we did exactly what he calls us to do. We love God, and we love people. And we told those girls who come from a background of being traffic in sex trafficking and girls who were vulnerable at high risk for sex trafficking, we told those girls that their life matters. And it's important to us that they have a place to, to live in and stay at. And it's taken care of because their life matters. Because what God wants for them is not what their past had and what their pimp had or their boyfriend had 
but God has a different plan and purpose for their lives, and they're only going to find it if we're willing to love God and love them. And we put tennis shoes on that, and we walked through it yesterday. And our, you guys are to be commended for that. It's a big deal. You know, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us to use things and love people. Sometimes we mess that up and we flip it upside down and we use people and we love things. But he calls us to use things, use all that we have and love people. Jesus said, if you want to become great, you need to become a servant. That's how you do it. What's easy is living in the moment. But our value is for eternity. The fourth question we need to ask, is it worth the price? Is it worth the price? Everything in life has a price tag. Nothing is free. I know you're hearing a lot about free stuff politically. Somebody's got to pay for that stuff. Nothing is free. And in our lives, with our finances, should I do this or should I do that? There are price tags on everything. Is the price tag on following Christ worth it? Let me throw a few verses at you. In Matthew chapter 16, in the Message Bible, Matthew's writing is, these are Jesus' words. Jesus went to work, and he's challenging his disciples here. He says, what kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? I mean, you could read The Art of the Deal, and that, that one doesn't come up at all. Doesn't even make sense. If you've got everything you want but, but you didn't have you. What could you ever trade your soul for, Jesus said. There's the value. Do you want values? There's your value. There's your value statement. And in our culture, here's the reality, church. We're following Christ, but all around us are people who are trading their souls for sex, for stuff, for drugs, for self-centeredness. And Jesus says, what is, what's, what's the value? They're making a poor investment that has absolutely no positive return whatsoever. Do you and I live our lives based on what is important? Let me just read one more passage of Scripture. Bring our whole team up here. I want us to do a song together. The Apostle Paul said, listen, if anybody can boast about their lives, I know I could. And he could. Because Paul was raised by the, the greatest tribe in Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. Not only was he he was a Pharisee. He reached the highest education even possible for someone like him. And not only did he have the education, Paul had an unbelievable type A personality temperament. Whatever he wanted, he went after and he got. Period. And he pursued his religion to the highest level possible. And then Paul looked at all of that after he comes to Christ, and he says this, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Then look what he goes on to continue to say. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite. Look at that word infinite. If you had it in your notes, you should circle it. Infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, Paul, at the top of his society, for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage with a capital G so that I could gain Christ. Church, what is shaping your values? What are we allowing to shape our values? Let's sing together. Stand up with me. I'll come up and close in prayer quickly after we sing. But what is shaping your values? Jesus let them nail him to the cross. And he said, listen, I've got tools and skills that are going to take you through every area of life.